Hey, Deserving Listeners, I have a special guest with me today, Anne Morrow. She is a graduate from the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University, Seattle. And she's a friend of mine, and I was at a recent conference in which she would she was presenting on a very interesting topic, and I asked her to come on the podcast to talk about it. Welcome to the podcast, Anne. Thank you for having me. Do you want to introduce yourself any further than what I just said? I think that was a great intro. Do you have a practice in Seattle? I do. I have a practice in Tacoma in the theater district. Okay. Tacoma in the theater district. Yes. Uh, how, where is that in relation to the waterfront area? Um, It's a walk away. Do you know where the Rialta is or Opera Alley? Not really. No. I mean, I've been all over Tacoma, but I, I don't know the names. I just know there's the there's that waterfront area with the glass museum and right. kind of the Capitol Hilly area that's right up there. Yes. And, okay. Well, yeah. so walking distance from there. Yes. Okay. So what was the title of your talk at the conference? Could sensate focus be an effective treatment for couples where one or both is early in gender transition? Okay. So sensate focus. Yes. Couples treatment. Yes. Trans. Yes. Early transition. Right. So what's sensate focus? Sensate focus is a hierarchy of touch exercises that Masters in Johnson's came Masters and Johnson Master and Johnson came up with. Um, in their practice, I believe they were treating couples with erectile dysfunction, and they were seeing a lot of performance anxiety that they called spectatoring. They were seeing a lot of that happening with their couples and weren't really sure what to do about it. And, so this is the 60s, 50, uh, 50s? Yeah, I think 60s is when Sensate Focus did come out. It might have even been 70s, to be 70s. honest. Yeah. And these were pioneering sex therapists? Right. I like to call them the grandparents of sex therapy, but I don't think they would like that or many people would agree with me, but that's where that's how I feel about them. Yeah. And they ran into people who were uh, uh, cis men who were having trouble with getting an erection. And they uh, observed that the problem was called spectatoring. Yes, which is a type of per performance anxiety. So one of the main ideas that Masters and Johnson wanted people to understand was that sex was a natural function. Mm. So it was something that you're born with, you can't be taught, and you don't have immediate control over. So you can't say, I'm going to have an orgasm right now and have an orgasm. Mm. And so they were seeing in these couples that there was a lot of this um, like cognitive um, distortions coming into their mind and worry about Am I pleasing my partner? Do they like this? Or how does my partner view me? Do they think I look fat in this position? Or how you view yourself? All these thoughts coming into your mind was interrupting the natural function, allowing yourself to go through the sexual response cycle. Mm -hmm. For both men and women. Right, yes. And so for the erectile issue, the, the boner problems, as I mm -hmm. like to call them, we got this thing called spectatoring, which is interesting word. Are they saying like, he, they felt as though they were being spectatored. They were spectatoring, maybe being a spectator of themselves. Of like themse they're viewing oh. themselves almost as a third person. I see. So they're spectatoring themselves, which interferes with being in the moment and right. letting the natural processes take right. place. Okay, so they observed that, and then they said, they, they did, through trial and error, developed this, this well, sensate focus well what happened was jenny johnson um they're like what do we do with this we have these people with all this anxiety and she said you know when i was a little girl i remember when my mom used to touch my face she called it facial facial tracing she would trace her face really slowly and it helped soothe Jenny Johnson and alleviate some of her anxiety and kind of regulate her. Oh. So she thought, wow, I wonder if we use this with these couples, we can help them with this performance anxiety. And what does that look like? What, what, how, how do you do it? How does facial tracing? Well, I think from what her mom did, it, it doesn't look the same. Sensate focus doesn't look the same as what that did, right. but it was just like a finger tracing over. Okay. I'm doing it right now. Like you guys can see me, but just tracing over your face yeah. slowly. So like your, your forehead and then with, with one finger, 
just your forehead then down your face i'm guessing mm-hmm. so that was the technique to help men with erectile problems that was the idea that started sensate focus okay and yes. then what did it blossom into well see there's a little bit of a problem because after they develop sensate focus they didn't um like report in detail what it was or how clinicians can use it with their clients okay so we don't have really concrete o a b c d from masters in johnson and a lot of people a lot of other sexologists have kind of taken their ideas and run with it and developed their own sensate focus the idea is to focus on a physical sensation to calm you and distract you from spectating yourself. That's right, yes, okay. yes. So it could really uh, be any sort of touching, and it's and it's usually someone else touching you? Well, so I wanna add too that Sensate Focus is the first mindfulness-based practice in sex therapy, so they are redirecting their, their thoughts to a tactile sensation. And after, I have to add Avery, um, Linda Weiner and Avery Johnson Clark, they studied under Masters in Johnson and came out with a book in 2015 trying to fill in some of the gaps that Masters in Johnson left out. So they gave us a little more tangible, tangible things. Tangible, tangibles. Tangible, tangibles. So the idea to draw a picture in the mind of the listener is that the the client comes in, the couples come in, mm-hmm. and the therapist is like, well, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just trying to extrapolate what yes. you're saying. And the therapist says, okay, well, here's how sensate focus looks, and here's how I want you to do it when you're at home, when you actually are in bed and you're about to have sex. No? No, we don't. We're taking sex off the table when we're introducing sensate focus. So it's, it's just a uh, beginning step to the erectile dysfunction treatment? The sensate focus? Yeah. Uh, you well, yeah. You want to use it in therapy with other therapy interventions, right? Yeah. But yeah, taking that home. So what I would tell, or what I do tell my my clients, is we're taking sex off the table, and right then and there, a lot of anxiety is already alleviated from them. There's okay. a lot of pressure and anxiety, and I'm saying this is a mindfulness a mindfulness practice. You're gonna go home and. And depending on the issues that my clients are presenting with, I may have them do sensate focus on themselves first to mm-hmm. really get the technique down. So they're going to go home. They're going to k- take the uh, genitals and the breast off limits, and they're going to touch maybe the outer extremities of their body, everything else, their face, just not genitals and breasts. By themselves or with each other? I do for It depends on the issue, right? So maybe with um, a childhood sexual abuse survivor, I would have them do it by themselves first. Okay. And so they're really trying to be mindful when they see or feel a cognitive distraction pulling them away. They want to go back and focus on either temperature, texture, or pressure. Physical those yeah th- those tactile sensations yeah so if you say oh gosh i gotta take the garbage out you want to go back and think is this cool or is this soft right and if you get distracted again you go back is this hard or is this light meaning the touch that they're experiencing right in that moment right okay yeah so so you're saying you're taking sex off the table mm-hmm. in terms of uh trying to rush things right but eventually that's the goal is but but for now at this stage you know let's let's not go there let's not add more pressure let's just start with step one and get used to that and then we'll talk at a later date about whether or not we want to take it to the next level is that what you're saying except i would disagree with saying goal because we don't want the goal to be intercourse we want the goal to really be um mindful of one's own experience Mm -hmm. and the client but they have a goal though right they they're not saying they're not coming to you and saying i want to be mindful of my of my experience right Right, they're coming to you because they want to have a a satisfactory sex life right exactly Mm -hmm. whatever that happens to mean right yeah okay so all right and then they go home and they do this by themselves or with their partner, Mm -hmm. uh, what do they usually say when they come back to you? I've had mixed reviews, different, different things 
from different people. Yeah. And I'll say that it's also a diagnostic aid is on top of being an intervention because I've seen things through Sensate Focus that I had not been able to see with working with a couple for over a year. It'll really things will in their relationship will show up Mm -hmm. when doing Sensate Focus. Right. So they might come back and say, I tried that for, I don't know, a couple minutes and I completely freaked out and I had a massive distressing panic attack. And so that helps to maybe understand the holistic view of this person's experience Mm -hmm. and and their reactivity or PTSD or something. Definitely. Or uh, I'm guessing there are other times where people might come in and say, uh, I didn't do it. I didn't really feel like it. <laughs> does, right. that ever, does that ever happen? It does happen quite a lot. So I try to let my clients know that this is really a time investment. Um, when you're doing it by yourself in the self-focus, they want you to do it six times a week. So just skipping one day out of the week, doing it every day. And right. it could take 15 minutes to 30 minutes a day. That's a big commitment. Yeah. Yeah. So it's basically mindfulness in terms of paying attention to your thought processes and trying to focus on a particular set of thoughts and, and perceptions, sensations, and sensations. And, and it, and it needs to be 15 or 30 minutes. It can't just be like a minute. You have to really kind of take the time. As far as time, I think, um, they want you to take an hour and you can split it up 30 minutes and 30 minutes, but you want to do it long enough to really get past like the embarrassment or the uneasiness at first to really get into it, mm-hmm. but then not so long that you get bored. Yeah. So if it's only been 10 minutes and you're getting bored, then it's time to stop and either switch or just stop with the f- exercise. Yeah. I'm guessing that for people that don't have a significant trauma history that would interfere or complicate it that and they're on board and relatively motivated or something that it can absolutely help uh, pretty quickly and they probably come back and say yeah i did it and i you know i i get i guess i'm understanding where this is coming from and the benefits of it or something but the people who have literally since day one have been mistreated and have a very firm pattern of avoiding their body Mm -hmm. for good reasons Mm -hmm. of uh, abuse and mistreatment, they are going to have a much higher mountain to climb to overcome and to begin to even know what they're feeling and be comfortable with what they're feeling and even, uh, again, it's not just a matter of being comfortable with it, which of course is a, is a factor, but also just even knowing what you're talking about. It's like, well, what do you mean taking notice of, of pressure? Uh, I don't even know. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, because people in my experience, because of mistreatment, they will cut themselves off from their body, not only from this uh, sensations of actual pain of being sexually or physically abused, but also because your body is a good indicator of emotion. And so if you're not, if you're, if you're cut off from your body, then you, then you won't notice your emotions either and you mm. can cope better with your life. So do you run into stuff like that? So we're talking about like somebody with childhood sexual abuse that's yeah. really having to relearn. Yeah. Touch. Like for instance, I've had clients who have, uh, who engage in trauma therapy with me. And okay. one of the major steps is being aware of your emotions. And who and there are people that I've worked with who are cut off from their body to su- such an extent that mm-hmm. when they recall events of distress for them, you know, like a guy will say, yeah, there was this, there was this guy at work and he was in my space. He was just really driving me crazy and I, I just wanted to kill him. I just wanted to throttle him. And I'll say, well, what was happening in your body or what do you notice in your body as you describe it right now? And they'll say, um, nothing. I don't notice anything. Hmm. And so it takes a while to connect the head with the body again for some people. And I'm just wondering if you've run into that with, with some of your clients. Of the lack of connection to their body? Right. Most definitely. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, and sexuality is the whole body, mind, soul experience. And mm-hmm. so getting connected to that is, I'm guessing, 
part of the work that you do with your couples. Right, yes. Okay, so then you uh, talk in your talk at the conference about Sensate Focus Mm -hmm. and the history of it, I'm guessing. Yes. And maybe visually mime what it is you know how you do it maybe i don't know did you do that in the conference i showed a video i i realized after the fact or when i showed up i was like oh i should have asked permission because these people are really super naked in this video i wasn't sure how they were is it a video you got from a training or something no it's from sex smart films a lot of sex educators can pull films from that website so it was sex sex smart smex yep sex (laughs) Sex smart oh sex smart yes not sex smart no, sex like smart. Like Kmart. I thought it was like <laughs> Kmart. <laughs> no, That's no. a different site. Yeah. Okay, so, and is that like a thing only certain paying customers have Yes, you have to? to get a membership for that, yes. Okay, and so they are naked and and and, and showing. Doing, yes, and I wanted to show in particular something called handwriting because in the beginning of Sensate Focus, we're not letting our clients talk. There's no verbal exchange because that's going to get them right back in their head and we want them to stay in their body in those sensations. Mm -hmm. So when a client is distressed or tickled or not feeling like they want their partner to touch a certain area, then we teach them to put their hand over their partner's hand and move it away from that spot. So that's handwriting. And then we also teach positive handwriting, which is putting your hand on your partner's hand and moving it to a place that you would be that you would prefer to be touched. Okay. Again, what I heard was handwriting, handwriting, like like, like uh, oh, writing, like a writing, like a like a like riding a horse. Yes, yes. Well, so I heard it wrong twice. So <laughs> I, the first one, I thought handwriting, like you would write a word, like p, and I don't know what word I'm spelling here, but like you know, you would write the letters. No. <laughs> and then no. the second meaning I thought you meant was writing, like you would correct a, a hand. But you're uh, you're saying like riding like a horse. You yes. ride, you know. The hand on top of the hand. Okay. Yeah. So so you, you showed that, and mm-hmm. then you also were talking specifically about trans uh, people and uh, involved in couples that, that you've treated? No, I okay. don't. I have not treated. This is just purely academic research that I did for our research class um, at Antioch okay. with McCall. Yeah, with McCall, who's been on the podcast before talking about parenting and other issues. And so you were in class and you you are given an opportunity to focus on a particular research area. Mm-hmm. And then you uh, expanded on that assignment and turned it into a talk at the Washington Association of Marriage and Family Therapy Annual Conference organized by um, faculty at Antioch, Jennifer Sampson. Yay. And you, so you you did some reading and some thinking about trans couples and specifically at early transition. So what were some details about that? Okay, so when I was looking into trans couples and the transgender population in research, I was finding a lot of really negative and oppressive and medical research is available. Stuff like intermittent partner violence, domestic violence, sex work, hormones, um, victimization, all this, all these things are just really heavy. And when we work um, as allies, we're talking about like work inclusivity, we're talking about health care, access to mental health care, the bathroom bill, just all this stuff that's just really heavy. And I hadn't planned on submitting for the conference, but just so happened on the deadline of when you needed to turn in proposals, Trump put a tweet out about transgender people in the military that really bothered me. So I thought, oh my gosh, with all this stigma around being trans and all this oppression, it's going to be a long time before we're really talking about pleasure and relationship wellness with this population. Mm. So that's what kind of motivated me to finally submit So with the research that I did find is that we have limited research on trans couples, the ones that are staying together. We know that um, they're staying together about 50% of the time if they're partnering pre-transition. So you know what the rate is for um, hetero cis couples for divorce rate or separation rate? Isn't it around that too, 50, 60? 
Uh, the rates are different, different depending on what angle you're looking at. Okay. If you're looking at individual people, it's different than if you're looking at individual marriages because okay. some people get married multiple times. Right. So I forget the exact figure. Okay. Um, but but I want to say it's around the same for the trans couples, okay. but they are going through a few different types of variables than the cis heterosexual yeah, couples. Absolutely. They have a few more challenges that they have to get through and they're having about the same outcome and success rate of their relationships. Okay. So I thought, wow, as a clinician, I really want to know how to help these people through this and started looking through the, the research and found that there's really limited research on what we can do um, to help our these couples survive transition to have a healthy relationship. Yeah. We know that early on in transition is when the trans identified partner has the most dysphoria. And that's when relationships can be kind of rocky is early on in transition. There's high dysphoria. They don't want their partner to touch their body. Um, um, their partner touching their body can trigger dysphoria, right? So when they get down to taking off their clothes and trying to have sex with somebody and they don't have the genitalia that matches what their gender is, it can be really distressing and cause dysphoria. Right. So a lot of people will take sex off the table or just have limited access to their body. Right. And we know that these couples have to kind of rene renegotiate a lot of parts of their lives, like their sexual orientation. Some people struggle with, you know, um, am I a lesbian now? You know, I was a straight person and now my partner's transitioned to a woman. What does that make me? And then how do we have sex and what does that look like? Right. And we found, or we, I found that it was easier for people that were more gender fluid to, um, to really overcome this difference. Mm. So if I'm a straight heterosexual woman that doesn't find women's bodies attractive, I'm gonna have a harder time that's, than someone who's more fluid and finds both female and male bodies attractive. Right. Yeah, okay. So what is your, I don't, do you, did you provide advice to clinicians and other sex therapists regarding this particular um, population regarding erectile dysfunction treatment and okay. sensate focus? Erectile dysfunction in uh, sensate focus? Yeah. Because no. what, what was the title of your of your talk again? It was, Could sensate focus be used with these couples where one is trans could identified? It be used? Yes, right. And what was your answer to that question? Or were you just we asking? still don't know because there's no know. there's no research right. on on this oh, at okay. all, right? Okay. So how do we have a best practice working with this population when we don't know right. what is the best practice? Right. But oh, I see. So your question is. Should we, we need to look into this yes. and you wonder if and how Sensate Focus would be used with early transitioning trans uh, individuals and, and their partners. Right. And how that might help to facilitate longer term relationships or relationship satisfaction. And sexual satisfaction. So, and, and particularly sexual satisfaction. Communication around bodies and what you like and what you don't like. Yeah. What's on limits, what's off limits. Yeah. Because, yeah, they need assistance sometimes in renegotiating bodies and touch. Yeah. And how do they do that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I could see that, that not only for that population, but I'm, well, I'm curious, what was the response from the crowd? Did you offer a Q and A portion of time? I did. Yes. Did Did they seem? Uh, I don't know. Were Were they happy to hear about this? Were they confused? Did they? Because I could imagine a lot of therapists were like, "Wait, so how do I be a sex therapist?" Because you know, I'm getting because mm. they're they're all clinicians, right? For the most part, if not all, yes. And a lot of them were marriage and family therapists right. who treat couples, and and just a anecdotal estimate, a lot of couples therapists have limited knowledge regarding sex therapy right or are just flat out uncomfortable talking about it yes and so they go to your 
con- they go to your, it was a conference with many different courses and, and, and breakout sessions. And I was on the ethics track, which, which was not your track. Right. And so I actually didn't get to see it. And I, in my head, I said, well, I'll just selfishly ask Anne to come on the podcast <laughs> and then I can just get the, get the conference. To- I did that to a number of people at the <laughs> conference actually. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, um, so I, I'm curious, like, what the vibe was among the, the people who were in the class with you. I think that they were really interested. I'll, I started with giving them a quiz, asking them about different terms around trans um, identities and, and things like that. So I think that was helpful to let them know that it's more than just transgender. This is an un, uh, umbrella term and there's lots of terms under there that people are identifying as agender, bigender, um, and we're cisgendered. Um, I, think, I think that helped too because part of what I was saying about research in trans folks is that what we're seeing is a majority of transsexuals are, are being um, represented in the research. Mm. And I think that's because of medical intervention. If they're seeking hormones or mental health therapy or something else, they're kind of being fast tracked into the research world or they're more easily accessible to researchers. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make that point and everybody, you know, was like, Oh yeah. Wow. Look at all these terms and open to that. I also did a disclaimer in the beginning that if they were interested in working with the trans population that they should dub, uh, they should visit wpath.org because they have a lot of great trainings, um, continuing education credits. And if they were interested in sex therapy certification to look at ASECT, ASECT.org. Mm-hmm. Are you doing that or have you done that? I am doing it and I hope to be done in about eight months is my isn't it like a couple years of courses? It is. It, well, yes, it's courses, it's it's training, it's supervision. You need 50 hours of supervision and so many hours of clinical hours. Yeah. It's essentially a very extensive continuing education situation. It's, it's not yeah. another degree. It's a specialization or certification, certification that is beyond your master's degree. Right. And I can't think of another certification that takes as long as, as sex therapy certification. It does <laughs> take a while. It's quite involved. Uh, the, uh, the ASEC people early on, I think, est- uh, decided that they were going to really go for it and make this a, as buttoned up as, mm-hmm. as possible. Uh, I think partially because of the history of people using terms like sex therapy in this very loosey-goosey manner, like having sex with your clients. A lot of people still associate sex therapy with like, oh, is that where therapists have sex with their clients Mm -hmm. or watch their clients have sex? Yes, I get that a lot. Which was uh, at least partially being practiced in the past uh, to at least a sensational degree to associate those terms even among clinicians, by the way. And so I think, uh, as with like art therapy and drama therapy, my observations are that because of a stigma around it, they're like, we're really going to shoot the moon on the certification Mm -hmm. requirements so that you cannot doubt the rigor of the designation as a certified sex therapist, you know? Yeah, it makes sense. Plus, there's a fair amount of anatomy and biology that probably needs to be incorporated right. and the typical master's graduate in therapy or counseling um, uh, in my experience has very limited uh, biology knowledge you know some obviously might just randomly because they were pre-med for a while or mm-hmm. something uh, or they used to be a nurse i suppose or a, or a physician but um but there's a fair amount of biology correct mm-hmm. right yeah, yeah. Yeah, because of course you know there's there's a lot of biology when it comes to the various different reasons as to what brings people into therapy for sex related issues. Right. Um, but honestly, the the times that I've treated people for sexual issues, it's it's always related to culture oppression, bad messaging early experiences, weird notions that we all have. Mm-hmm. We're, we're a super puritanical shaming society. Right. And 
um, the the analogy that I gave in the podcast recently was if if you were at work and you took a long lunch break and and got like a massage at a with a massage therapist at a spa or something, and you got back to work and you're like. Um, hey, I just got a massage. You know, they're like, they're like, oh, you look like you look happy. You know how you do? Well, I got a massage. Now imagine, so people would be read, people would readily reveal that you know I got a massage. Well, imagine if you went home and masturbated or something and mm-hmm. came back to work, <laughs> mm-hmm. or if you went home and had sex with your partner that you've been with for thirty years. Imagine, well, you know, me, I went home and me and the wife had sex. Right, <laughs> and it's just ridiculous that we can't talk about that, that it's still, we're ashamed as adults. It's sort of like my feeling of whenever, to this day, whenever I buy alcohol and they ask for my ID, I ha- even though I'm 40 freaking six, I still get a, a pang of shame or worry that I'm going to get in trouble for buying alcohol. Oh, Do you geez. know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's smaller than it was before, but I would say for the first 15 years of being super legal as a drinker in our society, I, I would, I would have this little like, Oh God, I hope this irrational sort of old tape of like, Oh God, I hope I don't get caught. And I think that we retain in a similar way, all the sexual shame that we incurred in our society. Yes. And so it's, it's, um, it's a very strange environment and produces a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, wrenches get thrown in the gears of everyone's sexuality and they end up uh, very unhappy mm-hmm. and then they em- end up in our offices. Right. And of course, the wrenches in the gears create a whole other set of adult problems, right? It, that all these experiences of things not going right and, and all these shaming moments and tense moments and then they come to our office and it's and we have to untangle all that, you know? Yes. And, and, but how glorious it is for people to shed that. I've, I've found in my experience that with fairly little intervention for people that haven't been significantly sexually abused, people are are very quick to shed a lot of the BS of society. Have Mm. you found that to be true? I, I think so. I think um, psycho ed does a lot yeah. too with these people kind of letting them know like, oh, that's a myth and this is the reality and this is what's really true about sex and bodies. What kind of myths do you hear? Oh gosh, so many. Um, I had one woman that came in, her presenting problem was that she is not having an orgasm with partnered sex. And, and she thought that she should be having an orgasm with partner sex without any clitoral stimulation every time she had sex. Mm. And I said, why, why, why do you think that? Where did you learn that? She said, from porn. Yeah. Oh, like, cool. So we had to do a lot of psycho ed around porn. Right. About it's not, it's not an accurate portrayal. Right. And, uh, right. So. And definitely not a female pleasure. Right. And so the, uh, next step would be to talk about how, uh, women can have an orgasm in uh, other ways. Did right. that did that work out? Um, I think it was a, a sh- because of her sexual shame and everything she had going on. When I talked about um, stimulating the clitoris while having partnered sex, she was very uneasy about even doing that and embarrassed to do that in front of her partner. Mm-hmm. And we didn't have follow-up appointments to check in mm-hmm. with that after, yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the advice or or throw that out there to see if it works uh, suggestions that you might have for some. What other kinds of suggestions might you have for someone in that in that su- position? For someone that's not orgasmic during during I'm, I'm, I don't know if you're talking about intercourse, heterosexual intercourse. That's for that that instance. That's what it was. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, that's interesting. So what about erectile dysfunction? What kinds of things have you done for people or have heard about with with regards to that? Well, Sensate Focus um, is pretty effective for erectile dysfunction. Um, A lot of um, that is anxiety too, performance anxiety. Um, I have one client on my caseload that may get an erection and then when he gets going into penis vagina sex he's like oh my god what if i lose my erection 
and then he loses his erection. Right. So helping him to not go to those, you know, intrusive thoughts about what if right. and staying in the moment and enjoying just the sensation. Right. So the uh, I'm guessing I'm extrapolating that the idea is, is that while they're doing their mindfulness, sensate focus practice, mm-hmm. they're putting aside their any thought, particularly anxious thoughts. Right. And focusing on the physical sensation. Right. And the three words were pressure. Texture, texture, and temperature, and temperature, and so you're going over. You're you're really focusing on that. Learning how to focus on that. That's right. that's the whole mindfulness thing is learning how to redirect think differently, essentially. Right. Yeah. And then and then once he transitions to actual intercourse, the same principle applies. So, you know, think about pressure, temperature, and texture, and don't think about other kinds of thoughts, particularly anxious thoughts, like mm-hmm. what if I don't keep this erection? Right. Or if you're thinking about, like you said, um, you, you know, your grocery list or something, that's, mm-hmm. that's not going to help either. Right. So, uh, so he's in a, in a transition time. He, he's gotten pretty good at, at the sensate focus task in and of itself. And now he's, he's at the next stage in terms of transitioning that into actual, um, intercourse with somebody. I would say we're still in the in the early stages of the doing the self focus and being able to redirect and staying present. Okay, and then eventually, once he becomes uh, m- more practiced and more, um, I don't know, the word that comes to mind is habitual about it or something, just mm-hmm. just easier and more of a habit of really focusing on a particular set of perceptions and and letting go of other kinds of thoughts then the idea is, is that his intercourse experience will will um, not be a, as much of a problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have not specifically sensate focus, but I've worked with men on what we call erectile dysfunction. And yeah, it's always some anxiety, the clients I've worked with. Mm-hmm. Of course, there are other causes, medical causes and this right. kind of thing. But the... the the litmus test I always ask is, can you masturbate? Right. <laughs> um, and they'll be like, yep. And, mm-hmm. and, they'll, and they'll be like, okay. And so when you're with your partner, oh yeah, that's when it's that's when it's tough. Right. And then we, you know, we talk about sexual orientation sometimes. It's like, are you trying to route yourself into a particular sort of person? Hmm. Uh, we talk about sexual abuse. We talk about, um, you know, other kinds of factors. But in, usually it comes down to performance anxiety. There's... Mm-hmm. For, for everyone, but for particularly men, because it's so visible and so obvious when things are working and when things are not working. Right. That, and, and so much of masculinity is tied up in, in boners. It's true. That, You're not a man unless you have an erection. And, right. Yeah. Constantly all the time. Right. Uh, and, and partners don't make it easy sometimes. No, they don't. Um, and so, uh, so all just a just a little you know little bit of all that stuff will throw a wrench in the system Mm -hmm. and and trying to unpack that for people i i find that it i i can pretty quickly help people to change their attitudes but the part of it that gets a little harder is when we're talking about how they interact with their partner right because we might be talking about a 20 year old you know, what I would consider a kid Mm -hmm. and early stages of sexual, uh, I don't know, uh, experience or identity exploration or whatever. And expecting a 20 year old young fella to have a vulnerable conversation about masculinity and shame and his inner feelings of anxiety is, is, from my experience, a tall order sometimes, but totally worth it, I think. I think it's a tall order just having conversations about sex. Yeah. So one thing I add when working with like erectile dysfunction is what does your relationship look like and how do you guys talk about sex? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Most people don't. Right. (laughs) And most people, it's just like a lot of unspoken communication that happens, but sometimes that's not sufficient to have 
everyone feel comfortable enough or to get their needs met or something right. like that. So, so that's where sex therapists come in and couples therapists come in. Um, mm. and, and there's just so much to be, to be done for people like this. I, I've worked with people, I guess, in a similar way, because I've never heard of Sensate Focus, but I worked with a couple for a long time, f- for years, actually. And one of the one of the phases of their sex therapy treatment was they would take showers together without any expectation of having sex and they would caress each other they mm-hmm. or or just sort of be cl- you know in a shower unless you have a humongous shower you're going to be bumping up against right, each other yeah. and just getting used to that again because they'd been together a long time mm. but they had m- many years of not having sex or having very awkward experiences with each other and so just getting familiar and comfortable again Mm -hmm. and i i framed it as they were dating again for the first time yeah they were uh so all the awkwardness of the first time you ever rolled around together is going to be present again and to not shame yourself or feel like you're there's something wrong with you for feeling awkward again Mm because it's you know it's been a lot of years and in some ways i never thought about this i never said this to them but in some ways there's more awkwardness in a situation like that, because usually when you're younger, say you're mid twenties and you're first beginning to roll around with somebody, there's awkwardness because you don't know them. But previously you probably dated someone else not too long ago and, and rolled around with them. And then Mm -hmm. there was another partner not too long before that. I've had couples who haven't rolled around with anybody, including their, their partner Mm -hmm. for 15, 20 years. Right. And so there's this huge desert of, of physical experience and the, the mind and the body, it just takes a while to acclimate back to that, you know? Right, yeah. Um, but what a wonderful thing to see blossom again for people that, that I've worked with. It gets, it can take a long time, but, but, um, but it uh, has a big payoff, let's just say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the sexual satisfaction and intimacy and love and comfort and... Um, connection. And connection and vulnerability mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. all that uh, facilitated through touching and sexuality. Where, so again, your practice is in Tacoma. Yes. And people can find you, Ann Morrow. Dot com. Ann Morrow dot com. Mm-hmm. A-N-N-E. M A U R O. Yes. Uh, at and and my, our friend Ivan Salivary pronounced oh, yeah. it Mauro or Mauro. <laughs> Mauro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was like, and who? He's like, you know, and Mauro. I was like, huh? And, and the, oh, Mauro. Um, and uh, so you, people can hit you up on your website for if they live in the Tacoma area, if they want to engage in sex therapy and also in couples therapy and yes. also in individual therapy yes uh regarding a wide variety of issues not just sexual issues right do you work with kids and teens at all um not so much i only have one teen on my caseload and pretty much it, it's all adults okay and they and if they don't live in the area they're just screwed they can't well that's not true you can drive in <laughs> <laughs> or i do offer video um counseling through vc too. okay okay mm-hmm. so they can hit you up on that and uh i'm so uh happy to see that you're successful after graduation it's always great to see graduates from the program doing so well i knew from an early time you were interested in sex therapy because i think you talked about it at your admissions interview it's if I'm, true yes. so which is also nice to see i mean i guess it, it's it's nice to see that you uh, managed to retain your initial uh, interest and in, and really stuck to it because i think a lot of people by the time they get done with their masters are like ah oh, i don't want to mm. take another stupid class yeah or they just kind of gravitate toward the middle of family therapy mm-hmm. in terms of the populations that you work with. But, uh, uh, but you, you know, really stuck to it. Said, you know, well, I'm going to graduate and I'm going to I'm going to make this happen. And because um, this has always been my dream, mm-hmm. and and so you're making it happen. And there's this huge market of people, I think, in need, and not enough clinicians to actually help. 
uh, with it. So uh, part of the, I think, problem is also there's not enough people that know they can actually seek someone like you out. Hmm. And there's also a problem of worry about uh, uh, the shame of asking for help and that kind of thing. Right, yes. But I would suspect, I don't know, 50 to 75% of Americans could benefit from at least five sessions with a sex therapist. I think so, yes. <laughs> I mean, just, yes. there, you know, it's just like there's always, because there's just so much shame and so much oppression and so much terribleness that uh, even if you're of a heterosexual couple, let alone if you're, if you're um, you know, not a heterosexual uh, person or a couple. And so, uh, so yeah, it's really great, great to see. And uh, um, I'll definitely, I think I've already added you to my list of sex therapists to refer to. Okay. Kind of wish you were in Seattle, but. Well, I think it's good because in Seattle, there is a lot of sex therapists. Oh. Uh, if we go back to what you were saying about the um, being being able to be called a sex therapist here in Washington, it's not a regulated term. So anybody can call themselves a sex therapist. So you need to be careful of that when you do mm-hmm. seek one. But as far as in the Tacoma, Pierce County, Gig Harbor, Ording, all of that, there's very limited. So I'm like one of the only ones. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. So it's good that I'm there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I'm guessing your clientele might come from a lot of different areas. They drive in f- yeah. far and wide. Yeah. And you're also next to the military base. It's true, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me, Anne. Thank you for having me. Thank you, listeners, for joining me. Please take care of joining us. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it.